So, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to have you here. Uh, we're going to be uh, continuing some threads of discussion from last time, but with a uh, departure in the direction of discussing um, uh, relating some of the material we saw last time to formal models. Um, the past two times, we've emphasized the notion that um, in a coupled nonlinear system, information from one piece of the system, while it may be measured or gathered from just one area of the system, it's of the nature of such, uh, such coupled systems that, that it encodes information about the dynamics of factors throughout the system that govern or influence, shape the evolution of that, that one component which we do measure. So there's this sort of holographic quality to our measurements in coupled nonlinear systems. Because they're typically irreducibly coupled, measurement of one piece tells us a world about what's going on on other coupled areas of the system, in other coupled areas of the system. That's been proven mathematically, and it's brought out at a practical level by uh, this technique known as delay embedding, which provides this mechanical way of going from a time series to a reconstruction of the state space of that area of the system that's driving the variable that's measured in that time series. So within these systems, information that's nominally just from one area of the system tells us about typically a much broader area of the system. And we, we saw in uh, yesterday's lecture, that two hour or that three hour lecture back to back, um, the implications of that across a variety of different um, types of, of research inquiry. Uh, we saw that it could lend the basis uh, for assessing the dimensionality of the underlying system. Even though we, we may not know sort of the most appropriate state variables to use to characterize it, although we may not have a formal model of the system, if, if we can perform delay embedding, we can create something that's, that's basically just a stretched, distorted version of the actual state space driving that variable, and we can assess the dimensionality of it and get a sense of how many, what's the intrinsic uh, number of degrees of freedom um, that are actually driving uh, this area of the system as measured through a variable. We also saw how it could be used to probe causality, the causal linkages from one variable to another using convergent cross mapping. Um, the fundamental insights relating to the fact that if one variable is causally driving another, information about that variable will be encoded within the state space. So if, X is, dri if y is driving X, information about Y is encoded in the state space as reconstructed from X, the so-called shadow manifold reconstructed from X. Information uh, as gathered by delay embedding can also be used for insight into the structure of the underlying system to help identify feedbacks. And for other purposes, we won't be going to in detail as well. All of that relates to intrinsic features of these coupled nonlinear systems. It's not contingent upon any given model of that system. It doesn't require us to put our confidence on or our faith in one particular model of a system. Rather, it's of the nature of these systems that they have this sort of holographic feature. That, that information from one area allows us to reconstruct the bigger picture of the system. I didn't talk about it, and I'm not planning to devote um, additional lectures to it unless we have unexpected windfalls of time. But I will note that 
within the broad area of what we talked about last time, there's a number of intriguing questions that arise. For example, we know how using one state variable, say x, we can create a shadow manifold m sub x, which reconstructs the element of the state space driving x. And if we have another variable, call it x prime, another time series that's um, closely related to x in, in its area of the system, but it's a little bit different. But we have reason to believe that probably the drivers for one are similar to drivers for another. Maybe it's self-harm on the one hand and suicidal ideation on the other, for example. Or maybe it's aspects of domestic violence, um, uh, violence against uh, partners, and violence against children, or something like that. If, if we have two time series, and we use them each to create shadow manifolds, is there some way that we could use both together to create a higher resolution view of the underlying system, gathering, gathering the insights from both, and using them to both illuminate um, the underlying system, much like we might use two telescopes focused on the Andromeda galaxy to get a, a better picture of, of that galaxy. Um, another question that comes up uh, concerns the, the challenges associated with missing data. Suppose we have X measured on a very regular basis, but some amount of the data is missing. We're missing maybe one out of every hundred measurements or something like that. How does that affect our ability to reconstruct? Another challenge might be if X is not measured in a periodic, in a fully periodic fashion. Maybe it's measured um, on average once per month, but um, with Poisson arrivals and a lambda of, of once per month. So sometimes it comes earlier in a month, sometimes later. How does that affect our, our ability to reconstruct the shadow manifold? Suppose we have, we, we talked about CCM and uh, trying to assess if, if a variable represented by one time series, Y, is causally driving, directly or indirectly, another variable represented by time series x. We want to know is, is y driving x. Um, I noted that my discussion last time uh, assumed that y and x are measured at the same time points. They're measured at the same time zone. Suppose they're not. Suppose that y is measured yearly and x is measured monthly. Or suppose that um, one is measured weekly and the other daily. Um, could we still assess this, uh, the, the presence of a causal connection? These are issues that I have not seen well explicated in the literature. Um, other issues come up with the nature of the data. We've been talking on a continuous space, let's suppose we don't have continuous variables, but rather we have uh, ordinal variables, variables that might have discrete possible values from 1 to 10, maybe from a Likert scale in a survey, for example. Um, uh, to what degree can we do this reconstruction effectively there? Um, I believe it can be done, I just I don't know of anyone um, actually doing it. Or suppose we have certain types of data that are contingent on others. So maybe there's certain, uh, a survey where certain of the questions are asked only of men and certain of the questions are asked only of women or certain questions asked only of smokers and others asked of everyone. And these are asked over time. How do we handle these, these situations where the space is not orthogonal? We, we have some types of information which are only present for certain subspaces. Um, uh, how can we use uh, similar approaches? Those, I think, are important open questions. And in fact, they, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a, a wide variety that could be formulated in this area. One of the areas that, that I find most interesting concerns the effects of noise. We saw that last time. The effects of noise and our ability to assess if variable Y is driving variable X, with each represented by time series. Um, in the presence of noise, we have uh, we have to deal with the fact that y is 
Y may be driving X, but X may be driven by stochastics as well, which obscure the effects of X. And in the, in the limit, where the noise is very large, the effects of X may be muted, may be small compared to the noise that's battering about X. And as we saw last time from those, those results I showed, um, as noise rises, um, at some point our ability to perceive causal connections gets swamped by the noise. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, at what point does that happen? If we have longer time series for Y and X, to what degree does it ameliorate that? To what degree does it lessen that effect, mitigate it? Um, uh, can we still be constructed with a long enough time series? These are important questions. And this is kind of a loose end that I haven't talked about, but I need to come back to. And to a degree, it will bear on the next few lectures as well, um, which are more model-based. And that concerns the nature of noise and the nature of state and, and indeed, uh, the nature of prediction, the information required for prediction. So we've been talking in this class about state space for particular models. And from the very first lecture where I presented those, those sort of four different perspectives on systems, two structural, two behavioral, I noted state space is a very useful construct for reasoning about behavior. And we've seen recently more diagrams focusing on state space than we have on temporal behavior, just the nature of what we're talking about. Um, and uh, the representation of state space will, will continue. And, you know, informally you could, you could be excused for thinking about state space, the dimensionality of state space and as asking, if you ask, What's the dimensionality of a state space for a system, the intrinsic dimensionality? I've used words like degrees of freedom. How much, how much flex does it have? How, how, many, how, mu how much sort of give does it have? Once you consider all the coupling between variables, nominally you may be dealing with four variables, but it only has really three variables that, that are materially different. Maybe the fourth one can be computed from a constant minus the sum of the first three in the most trivial case. Or maybe because of such high coupling, really it was, uh, like the Lorenz attractor, that attractor that I showed you last time, the so-called strange attractor it's called. Um, uh, that, that attractor um, uh, has a dimensionality that's close to two, even though it has three nominal variables, because it's so coupled. And we could think of state space as the intrinsic dimensionality as having to do with, with indeed, this, this degrees of freedom. But another way to think about it is uh, concerns how much information will we need to save away about the state of the system in order to predict it forward, in order to you know, you can imagine, you know, imagine a, in any logic model or Venson model or model in Maple for a differential equation and imagine that you're running a simulation over time of a system. Maybe it's an SEIR system or what have you. Maybe it's a predator-prey system. And then for some reason you have to shut down your computer. But later you want to resume that computation. You want to, you want to continue it. How much information would you have to save away to allow you to continue it? How much is needed to, to save away, to, to have all the salient information you need to continue that computation? You could view that as being a matter of, of, of what the, the intrinsic dimension only has to give. Um, if, if some variables can be computed from others, you just have to compute, save away those other variables and you can compute the other one. So you don't, you don't need to save away all of the nominal variables. The others are implied by that. Um, so, um, we can have these different views of, of state. Now, I'm using this to lead up to the notion of noise. Noise. Um, 
And I think the best way to approach the issue is to now talk about <coughs> the perspective of prediction. If we want to predict where a system is going, where it's going to evolve to in the next little bit, it's not that different from that last problem I just mentioned, which is how much information do you have to save away to resume the computation? If you think of resuming the computation as prediction, you know, the ability to kind of look forward, to run it forward, um, how much information you have to save away is maybe pretty much how much you need to do to predict where it's going. You have to save away the, the salient information to understand its natural evolution from now. It allows you to predict it. And within this world, there's a subset of the modeling community wholly focused on prediction. You know, in, in, in our subset of the modeling community, the bigger emphasis is actually on, on intervention. It's on how does intervening in a system uh, change things. But in some quarters, and I include here the quants on Wall Street, most emphatically, um, the focus is on prediction. It's, you know, where is the stock market going to go tomorrow? Where are these, where are these uh, derivatives, uh, the pricing of these derivatives going to go? Or where is the real estate market going to go so that, you know, I can make a killing or whatever? This, this is the, what a lot of people use simulation models for, is to try to anticipate or predict. And even in the health space, there's a fair bit of that, right? We want to know, are we on the cusp of a big outbreak of pertussis or measles. We want to know, is flu season going to be big this year? And in the prediction sphere, um, the, the intrinsic dimensionality of a system is of great interest because it actually tells you how much information do I need to know to predict where the system will go. If I can characterize the intrinsic uh, uh, all the information required by intrinsic dimensionality, then I could extend my understanding of the trajectories forward from where they are now. If I, if I don't have that much information, I must judge where things are going to go. If I have enough, I can, I can predict. And I'm glossing over some things, but, but basically prediction has a world of linkages to the issues of how much, what's the intrinsic dimensionality of, of the system. And in fact, you'll find much of Sugihara's work with CCM as kind of being pursued with a prediction bent. Um, maybe you're trying to understand the, the amount the fisheries will bring in um, from fish stocks in, in the Pacific um, from its position at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Now, I'm, I'm leading up, though. I'm, I'm operationally um, focusing my comments here to lead up to my main topic of the next few minutes, which is noise. How does noise play a role? If we have noise, if we have stochastics within a system being added, how does that change our ability to think about the dimensionality of a system? Um, if we have a system that's characterized by what's known as white noise, um, noise that perhaps is, we could think about it moment to moment as being drawn from, from normal distributions, um, uh, and the value for the next moment is independent of the value for the for the last little bit. The value for the next day is independent of the value for the, for the previous day, independent of the value for the, the last day. Yeah. And if we, if we pause to think about what's the dimensionality associated with this, we're left with a bit of a quandary because in principle, for, for true white noise, for noise where the next little bit of change over the next day is totally independent of yesterday, the day before, the day before, the day before, the day before. No matter how much information I know about recent days, I can't predict the next little bit of noise. 
And what that suggests is that the, the intrinsic dimensionality of white noise approaches infinity. Okay, so in, in the limit, white noise has infinite dimensionality. You can't predict what it's going to do next, no matter how much information you have. No matter how much information you gather, you're not going to be able to predict where this trajectory is going to go next. Um, or, if I think about it in a state space context, I can't just summarize its evolution as a manifold in some small number of directions, uh, dimensions. No matter how many dimensions I add, if I add another dimension, four, five, it'll still look like a, like the values from one time to another will still look like a kind of a ball. I won't, I'll never get to adding a dimension and I see, oh, adding that dimension doesn't add to its intrinsic dimensionality. You know, it's not that it, it looks like a ball and when I add a fourth dimension, I see, oh, it, it doesn't vary with that fourth dimension. It's just a 3D object embedded in, 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 in four dimensions. I add a fifth dimension, it's just a 3D object still. With, with a system of limited intrinsic dimensionality, once you reach that requisite number of dimensions, adding more of them doesn't add to the measured dimensionality. It's just embedded. It's like that you know, that sheet of paper or that tube that I created courtesy of, of Cheyenne Arifat. You know, it's like the sheet of paper in 3D. If I go from 2D, a 2D space, this looks like it's 2D in a 2D space if it's embedded, you know. It's on the surface of that table, right? But if I look at it 3D, it still looks 2D. If I look at it in 4D, it still looks 2D. If I look at it in 5D, it looks 2D. And, and so I have the intrinsic dimensionality gives me a kind of limit on how much adding dimensions will continue to change its perceived dimensionality. With white noise, no matter how many dimensions, no matter how far back I look, there's added information being, being gained. And at no point will I be able to predict its next little bit. So noise has, in principle, infinite dimensionality. Infinite. Um, intrinsic dimensionality. And if you start combining that with something of limited intrinsic dimensionality, let's suppose a shadow manifold reconstructed, um, as you add new dimensions, the noise will be the thing whose dimension keeps on increasing. The, the intrinsic dimensionality, the underlying the underlying governed factors may not increase, but the, the noise will continue to, to be pronounced. It will look like higher and higher dimension. And so we have to be careful when we have noise. Now, the truth is that w we don't deal with that many things that are likely to be of, of approaching infinite dimension as noise sources. You know, we often put noise into our models to characterize things in the world they're outside the scope of the model and, um, and, and would be inconvenient to, to characterize in more detail. Maybe it's weather, maybe it's economic you know, trends or shifts that we can't readily predict and where, where the added value for predicting them is limited. Sometimes we go from white noise to what's called pink noise. We integrate the white noise and we get a, a random walk from integrating this that, that, that changes. Um, but the point is that when we're dealing with noise, it can have very high dimensionality associated with it. Realistically, you know, once you get to enough dimensions, even things like weather, I mean, there's, there's regularity, right? Um, it's, it's very unlikely if we walk outside or as you walked here, you had, you know, some minutes you were walking in 35 degree temperatures, and other minutes, you know, you were in a, in a, a you know, Arctic blast, and and then in between, it, you know, you were in a monsoon or something like that. That's that's not the nature of things. There are regularities, um, and we may approximate 
certain factors as noise, but but in fact, you know, when we look at real world data, there's uh, there is often limited dimensionality. Just be aware that when we have things that are kind of outside the scope of our interest for governing factors, they may have intrinsic dimensionality, which is very large compared to our the factors we're interested in. And it turns out with CCM, with assessing whether one variable influences another, the influence of noise can be considerable. And particularly as higher, as we look at higher number of dimensions for in the embedding dimension E, the dimensionality associated with these uh, vectors, um, we could see big effects of noise often amplified, it seems, uh, in practice at, at, at those higher dimensions compared to the intrinsic dimensionality of the system. So um, noise uh, is going to affect our ability to analyze data from these systems, and I think I'll give you a little exercise doing that with um, the REDM package. Um, there's also some there's also some other factors that, that play a role, which I skipped to, to be able to finish up that material last time on CCM. One of the factors is something that, um, that Yang Chen has written about convincingly as a important consideration in using advanced analytics with, with uh, combining data and models, and that is the role of data conditioning, okay? Um, so let's consider, let's consider a system where we have causal linkages uh, between, uh, uh, between factors. And, and I'm going to put up here, because I, I erased it there, I'm going to put up this very simple system, x and y. So this is going to be prey and predators, OK? And we're going to have fluctuations um, uh, of each largely driven by the other. Uh, we, have, we have rates of uh, growth of the prey population that depend not only on the birth rate of prey, but the number of predators around to eat them. And we have fluctuations in the births of predators that depend on um, not, not just the, the presence of predators to, to, to uh, multiply naturally, but also on the availability of prey. Um, and, and so we have these, uh, these couplings associated with each whose equations were written on the board there, right? And we saw these sort of oscillations, not quite, not quite um, totally symmetric, but these oscillations that, that occur for each of predator prey, right? And if I drew it carefully, I could probably capture the fact that prey multiply more quickly than predators, predators overshoot the prey, um, they, they uh, eating up the prey when predator numbers are the highest, and prey go down very, very quickly then, and then predators collapse. Um, and I could draw that, but what I want to draw attention to from a CCM perspective here, for assessing, for example, whether predators influence prey, or vice versa, or both, or neither, is something that, that, that stands out very clearly from this diagram, but should also be fairly clear from other types of modeling, be it agent-based or, or discrete event simulation, and indeed hybrid approaches. Mm. Um, and that concerns the fact that perhaps from a standpoint of of, uh, this, of of assessing impacts of one variable and another, we're considering the impacts of, uh, we're asking, are X and Y, predator and prey, causally related? So we want to know, is Y driving X? That was our sort of index question that we asked last time. Is X driving Y? That's just the co of this, we just flip the direction of the arrows, um, are, are both influencing each other or neither influencing each other? A yes, no answer to each of these would, would give delineate those four possibilities. 
Now, let me ask this. From a causal standpoint, from a standpoint of what's governing y, is x governing y here? Is x driving y? If we say for it is, yes, most certainly. And is y driving x? Most certainly. Is the value of x directly determining? This gets into the domain question last time to a degree. Is the value of x directly determining the value of y? If, if I have x, does it directly specify y? No. No, actually, this was not Dumain question. I think this may, be, may have been a Shaoyanian question. Um, who was it? Alas, um, uh, I show my age. Um, who was it? What fine student in this room asked the question? Um, asked the question about, um, suppose there's Suppose there's two values of y that influence x in the same way. I think that question was asked by Shaw. Yeah, true or not? Uh, um, so is x directly determining y? It's, de it's determining the what? The inflow. Yeah. So it's determining, we, we could be excused for saying it's determining it's strongly shaping, strongly governing. That doesn't mean it's the only factor, but it's strongly governing the rate of change of y. And same thing, y strongly change the rate of change of x, right? When we're dealing with stateful systems, ladies and gentlemen, when we're dealing with systems that are dynamical systems, um, their evolution depends on their state. And generally speaking, one aspect of state doesn't directly determine another. Here within system dynamics models and, and you know ODE models, um, influences from one variable to the other are not algebraic in nature in terms of the state variables. It's not that y is x squared or something. It's not that y is square root of x. It's not that y is the absolute value of x. Instead, the rate of change of y depends on x. Um, we could. You're, you're saying using the like Taylor expansion? No, no, ju no just because you have right here is we can just write the equations of x cat equals uh, y, yeah, plus y. I think Shania was saying was that if you were saying the last time, if we know the grade of change of x or y, we can derive the value of for x. That's y. correct. So, so if we look at those slides from last time, and this might be a fruitful exercise for, for, for several reasons here, um, we will. So this is these are are fantastic questions. Um, uh, so if we, I think what. Uh, the, the slide to which you refer is this one, perhaps, that, yeah, yeah. that using knowledge of x, if we have knowledge of x, and in fact, if we have knowledge of the constituent yeah. equations of the system, the governing equations of the system, um, we can determine the value of y. Yeah. That's true. That, that, is, that is true. Um, so x here is one of the factors that dictates y. But it's not x alone, it's x dot as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and in fact, x is here in the numerator and the denominator. And you might argue this ends up being x dot over uh, something x, right? Yeah. Because these two um, conspire to, to cancel. And, and those, those do determine y. So, you, so you're right, there's, there's an element um, and, and that's an interesting observation that I need to chew on, um, or I, forgive my lapse, on which I need to chew. 
Um, uh, so, um, uh, so, but nominally, in terms of the the ODEs, X operates on Y through the rate of change of Y, and Y operates on X through the rate of change of X. So, if we're assessing, does Y drive X? There's a fruitful question that the creator of CCM. Um, make some intriguing comments on, and it's clear it's part of his practice, but um, uh, it's never really a, a fully resolved issue. But it goes back to some of his earliest papers from the 1990s related to this. That, and this is a practice you see in dynamical systems, that often rather than operating off of this, so we may say we're trying to assess the, the, the causal inference of y on x. And we're using this method, CCM, to say, does x, y drive x, does x drive y, neither. And, and to do so, robust to, not confused by mere correlation. It's causal connections. We're identifying the causal connections with CCM is the goal. And what he argues is that often what you want to do is to actually not deal with x and y directly, but to deal with their, what's called their first differencing. So you undergo a step of data conditioning, not unlike some of the steps that uh, Chin Yang undertook for her, for her work with hidden Markov models. So in this case, what we're doing is we're taking what's called the first difference of, of X, and maybe I'll call it, you know, uh, X uh, first difference here. And X first difference, the value for a given time t will be x at t minus x of t minus 1. So it's sort of the, you could think of this as the rate of change, right? Something similar to the rate of change. And Sugihara argues that often before performing CCM, you do well to look at not the variables themselves in this picture, but their first differences. And in our own work evaluating CCM, um, what I found is that, in fact, sometimes the most fruitful thing is if you posit that Y is driving X and X is a state variable, often it's fruitful to ask, is the value of y driving the actual value y of t? Use that as the relevant variable, and to what degree is that driving the rate of change of x? So you use the first difference of x. So in other words, you choose which ones to first difference, whether it's a stock, whether it's a state variable, or whether it's not a state variable. And measurements we get from the world, ladies and gentlemen, it may not be obvious. You may think of the issues of what's a stock and what's a flow as something you only think of when you go to build a model. But it's far from the case. When we're dealing with observations from the world, it's often fruitful for us to ask, is this a state variable? Is this an element of state of the world? Or is it like a rate of change or some other instantaneous quantity. This is almost a metaphysical thing, but it's, it's a very fruitful th thing to reason about from a data science perspective, actually. I find myself thinking about this quite a bit when thinking about data conditioning, particularly when it comes to causality. There are certain things in the world, let's suppose the number of patients in a hospital right now, well, you tell me. Would you think of that as a state variable or stock, or is is that something that's that's not naturally conceived of us of that? The number of people in a hospital right now. It's a stock. It's an aspect of the state of the system that changes, but it doesn't change instantaneously. From, uh, from moment to moment, right? It, it has state associated with it. 
It has continuity associated with it. If we look for small periods of time at you know, changing less, what things that affect that do so through discharges and admissions and so on. It doesn't change, you know, just in and of it in and of itself. By contrast, if you consider something like number of of suicides that occurred in a given day or number of suicide attempts, that's that's not a stock. That's not a a quantity that's conserved and which has persistence associated with it. It's not something which which has a um, you know a slope a, a, a rate of change that's that tends to be governed only by things that build it up and things that decrease it. If we look at it from one day to the next, it can be very different um, uh, in, in its particular values because there's no there, there's not a you know, a sort of inertia there about about it that has to be decay away or built up. You know, informally, in my 394-858 class, you may recall from a classroom not far from here, me articulating the idea that, look, state variables, stocks, are the things which if you were to freeze the state of the system, if you were to say, okay, we freeze the world right now, um, we could record what that value is. We could go through and say we could count the number of people in the hospital, right? We could count the number of people who have diabetes or count the number of people who, have, uh, who are you know, uh, below the age of a certain thing. It's sort of an aspect of the, the situation in the world right now. By contrast, we could not go through in the world and count the number of people who are getting diabetes per day. New, new diabetes per day. We can't count, you know, in this world the number of, of individuals who, who are, you know, who have um, uh, a, a, attempted to take their life in the last day, or, or the number of uh, the number of individuals who are newly associated with ideation in, in the next day. That's not an aspect of the, the current state of the system. It's a, it's a rate. It's associated with a rate of change sort of change from one step to the other. So we can't go through and sort of enumerate it at, at any one time just by looking at the current situation, right? Similarly, like for this, like consider physical quantities, like the amount of water in, in you know, Wollaston Lake. We could at any one time freeze that. <laughs> we probably don't have to engage in that. Um, uh, ourselves, nature can help us right now. But you know, we could ask how much water is in Wollaston Lake right now. By contrast, if we want to know, you know, what's the rate of flow of the South Saskatchewan River right here through town, we can't freeze time and go out and and count that because it's actually a, a change in time. So if you think about a lot of measurements from the world, they actually relate on the one hand, to, to one of these classes of things, either you're dealing with a, an aspect of the state of a system, you know, someone's level of blood sugar right now, or someone's, um, you know, whether or not someone has a certain condition, or they deal with, with quantities that are like incidents, you know, like number of new cases of this, or what have you. Those are different sorts of things. Um, often the the quantities that are not stocks are rates, not always, but but often the rates, and often they are um, they are things that have a per unit time associated with them because it's change per unit time. And it turns out that um, my own work has suggested that first differencing in the CCM context is is commonly most effective when you first difference things that are that are socks, and you don't first difference things that are that are not stocks. Um, so if it's a stock, this kind of makes sense. If it's a stock, like number of predators, first differencing it will focus on how is that stock changing? How is the number of predators, the change in the number of predators evolving? And looking at the causal connections driving that will often bring out the causal connections in a more in a stronger way, make it more obvious whether or not there's causality 
from from prey to to predators if you focus on the change in the rate of predators. Conversely, if you look at you know uh, change in the number of prey, that also focuses more directly than if you just look at the number of prey themselves. Change in the number of prey is more directly driven by why. It's more directly by, driven by the number of predators. Um, and, and it's interesting because this is not the only time where these things from conceptualizing a system as a dynamical system come into play in our data analysis. Um, but this is, this is an important feature here for data conditioning for assessing causality. Um, it allows us, because uh, is X driving Y? Yeah, it's, it's driving Y. Um, but X may be even more strongly driving the change in Y. And, and that may be much more obvious because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a market influence here. And the same thing with Y driving X. Okay, so when it comes to analyzing data, particularly for causal understanding, to identify the causal linkages between variables, is this driving that? Doing so, taking into account some data uh, conditioning is quite useful. And I actually had cut out some, some comments on this right here on delay embedding um, and first differencing. Um, uh, often there's a standardization process we go through to kind of normalize for the ranges as well. We maybe um, divide by the mean and, and um, or subtract off the mean rather and divide by the, the standard deviation. Um, but we, we might go through and in first differencing it. Um, and it turns out Sugihara argues without really talking about it extensively that first differencing also reduces autocorrelation. And this is related to it being a stock. <laughs> it's, it's funny how these same things come up with the different guys. Um, um, there's a view of history first related to me by a, um, a, a, an, an intriguing and uh, uh, deeply insightful archaeologist by the name of Charles Nelson. Um, uh, who, who argues that many historical trends uh, can be seen as continuation of early trends just with repackaging and relabeling. He, he gives the analogy of history in a given region, he was dealing with uh, East Africa, I think, to a mask. Um, I don't know if uh, those from um, uh, who are, who are uh, born outside uh, North America or Europe would, would know uh, about the the uh, cultural practice of masks, um, but they were quite the phenomenon in Europe for many centuries. And this is not M A S K, but M A S Q E Q U E. <laughs> um, do, do you know about masks? Okay, so masks. <laughs> I horribly abuse this, and I would welcome anyone who knows more about masks to uh, to correct my my crude rendition of them. But masks were an event whereby people, it was kind of like a kind of like a ha Halloween party on steroids, um, which, which, you know, um, um, sort of raises uh, perhaps uh, the imagination as well as eyebrows. Um, or it's a costume party where people would change appearances in the midst of the costume party by donning different um, different costumes, and to, to disguise their face, they would put on a mask, like an M-A-S-K mask. But it was called the mask. The entire event was called the mask, and, and, and it involved dancing, um, where you wouldn't know for sure who you're dancing with, uh, uh, and they would, they would change appearances, and so sometimes it would be the same person you were with a few minutes ago, but you both look totally That's different. Fun. What's that? That's fun. You want to propose that for our lab? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the party's coming. Sorry? The Christmas party's coming. <laughs> that, okay. <laughs> now you get, get Christine on this idea, and we can get so, some really interesting things. So they would have these, these sort of um, masks that they would ceremonially put over their face. They would hold it with sort of a selfie stick type yeah, contraption. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, 
and you know you weren't quite sure is this the same person as earlier and to the degree there was um, you know um, uh, there was flirtation involved it was a little bit difficult to know like you know is this the same person I was dealing with and who is this and, and so it led us sort of to a to a to a, a real um, set of intrigue so he argues that history is like a mask that it's the same actors often putting on different masks uh, fundamentally over time and it's the same interest just repackaging what they um, you know what how they present themselves in their their points of view with just different names and different different justifications and different pet causes and different labels um, but often it's the same sort of historical threads just intermingling with different different uh, superficial appearance um, and and by viewing it as this you can sometimes better understand where things are coming from I will share with you um, uh, I am a student of history and uh, I uh, found that initially a notion that was intriguing but unconvincing. I didn't know enough about the East African context. But I can most assuredly um, uh, guarantee for you that this plays a role in the uh, history of the United States in the past uh, century um, for reasons that will be beyond the scope of this <laughs> course to go into. But um, uh, it's it's very 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 clear, and uh, shall we say all the more clear in the past few years. Um, uh, so, um, how do we get to masks? <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, uh, pop off the stack. Yes, 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 yes. Right. Okay, so so ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So. Uh, Actually, some of the classes that um, those in the classroom may have been required as undergraduates in Marxian theory actually relate to the whole mask idea too, but we won't we won't go into that. Um, so, so Marx was sort of, I think, a subscriber of, of a similar notion, although his his parsing of it is very different than mine. Um, in any event, um, what we um, uh, what we have here in the data science and system science standpoints are often different cousins of each other. And you see the same issues coming up in different language within data science that are identified in system science. And sometimes you see things like standardization or first differencing applied in, in data science without necessarily the, the firm understanding of, of why they're useful from a system science perspective, like the relationships to stocks and flows and, and variables where, where we, or they're better understood as, 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 uh, as elements of, of the state of an underlying system. And one of the, the phrases you hear talked about there is autocorrelation. That in a data science context, in the, in the context of CCM, and assessing whether one variable driving another is indicative of, um, of, of causal linkage. One of the things you'll hear observers talk about is the effect of autocorrelation, that the presence of autocorrelation in X, maybe X is, is prey, and you're trying to assess whether predators are driving it, the effects of autocorrelation in X obscure the effects of Y driving it. And so, therefore, you first difference it to eliminate the autocorrelation. Do you folks know what autocorrelation is? So it, it, it reflects, uh, particularly in time series analysis, when we have successive measurements, the fact that each successive measurement is, is maybe um, far from independent from the previous one. It's actually maybe quite statistically dependent on the previous one. It may not have a full set of information to give you because it's a close cousin of the previous one. And autocorrelation is seen as the bane of, um, of, of many statistical, I shouldn't say the bane, but it's, uh, it's, it's seen as something you want to um, manage or control. You want to limit its, the distortions caused by this in a lot of data science activities. Uh, for example, in NCMC. Um, uh, and uh, in, in certain aspects of time series analysis. So, so within the sphere of, um, of data science, we often talk about autocorrelation. 
um, being uh, an issue. And the one way to deal with that is first differencing. You subtract one value for, for, for a given time point, you subtract the previous value from this one. Instead of look at x of t, you look at the change in x of t. And it's of the nature of things that something being a stock tends to mean it's autocorrelated if you look at it in successive points in time, because the stock is inertia. A stock has state. A stock is a state variable. It has state. And so if you measure it now, and you measure it a short time later, guess what? No surprises. It's going to be autocorrelated. The value now is going to, it's going to be very dependent upon the value the previous little bit of time ago, because it has state. It has memory. It has inertia. It's an accumulation. And so, you know, in the language of data science, this is a matter of autocorrelation, and we do first differencing it. For in the language of system science, it's a matter of this is a state variable, and the drivers often operate not directly on a state variable, but through the traits of change of that state variable. It, you know, patients in the hospitals are changed not uh, not in some instantaneous way, willy-nilly. They're changed by increases to admissions or by increases to discharges or you know decreases to each to changes and in, and in, in, in discharges or admissions. And so, from a system science standpoint, it's very natural we focus on the flows of the state variable, not its value, and that automatically you know, gives us something that deals with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the autocorrelation as well. So if we, if we can choose variables on which to undertake the CCM, we can choose them uh, uh, judiciously in ways that take advantage of knowledge, knowledge of the stock, uh, uh, stock and flow structure of the system, where we don't have the option of measuring things, you know, the rate of change of the hair population or of the lynx population. Those might be very hard to measure, um, for example, for that, that example, um, uh, getting trappers to go around and count, you know, the number of hairs that have died you know, in the past little bit, or the number of hairs that have been born, leverets, um, then, you know, it's, difficult, it's more difficult than counting the number of hairs that they encounter or, or they trap. Um, uh, it may be easier to just uh, first difference and to get something that's like a rate of change of this. Okay, it's, it's similar to a rate of change. And that may show the effects of, uh, of causality from, from, um, uh, from as driven by y, if we look at the rate of change of x more more clearly than does uh, uh, than just look at x. Um, so, so Sugihara argues in a CCM context for use of, of first differencing um, this sort of uh, uh, conditioning step where we subtract successive values and argues it reduces autocorrelation, sort of spurious correlation and, and trends. And the claim is that it, it allows for better recognition of the underlying uh, dynamics. And what I found is that it's best to, to perform it um, uh, when we're dealing with state variables, but, but, not, uh, but not from variables that are, that are not state variables. So if we have predators driving x, we don't first difference predators when we ask, does y drive change in x? We, we ask, does y drive change in x? Because it's predators who are leading to the change in x. It's predators who are eating x. It's not the rate of change of predators that is leading to, to, to drive the rate of change of x. The, you know, how quickly prey are being captured. It's actual number of predators. So here, if, if you're saying is y driving x, you first difference x, you don't first difference y. And that often brings out that, that driving status causally in a clearer way than if you look at first difference of both, or if you look at is at y directly driving x. You can get a sense of causal linkage there, it just may not be as strong, and therefore noise may obscure it more easily or what have you. Okay? So, so this is one of the ways that, that a, a system science lens can 
shape the techniques we use in data science techniques to, uh, to analyze things. So I would count CCM as a system science, as a data science technique whose grounding in theory is based in system science and dynamical systems theory, um, uh, but which is applied as a data science tool to assess the presence of causality or, or lack thereof between successive variables and data conditioning is an important part of, uh, of, of, of the practice of using it most effectively, um, particularly in the presence of, of noise. So those are some comments on CCF um, and some comments on uh, some of the sort of additional factors that, that come in to play with CCF. Any questions on that before I motivate the next big topic, which is going to occupy us for Thursday, and perhaps Christine um, will have scheduled also a, uh, a makeup session before the next Tuesday as well, um, which is particle filtering and then particle MCMC. Any questions on CCM, delay embedding, and those components? Yes, that's yeah. Yeah. So, so the analysis of the CCM can also help us to understand the structure of a, a ST model. That's what you have mentioned. I love your question, and uh, thank you so much for that question, because I sit remiss. Um, and now I stand for this. Um, um, I should have hit that point, and I I am neglectful, and nay negligent for having done so. So let's talk about CCM. CCM is a data science technique rooted in system science, which we can use to to identify the presence of a causal driving of one variable by another, when we have two time series for each that are contemporaneous. They're measured at the same time and over similar time horizons. How does this play a role within system science practice? I argue it can play a huge role, a huge role. But that role currently is rarely realized in, in, um, in other groups. And even in our group, we haven't fully tapped it. But I'd like to enumerate several ways that it can play a, a fruitful role and put them out there for your thinking, OK? The opportunities are rich. And I'm going to throw out a couple ideas here. Look, often when we're dealing with these complex systems, they're tangled. They're coupled. It's hard to know from the data we see, you know, what's driving what. It's kind of like a chicken and egg problem. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to say which of these things is driving driving the other, um, or both driving each other. You know, maybe it's it's uh, uh, domestic violence and um, and self harm. Um, uh, or domestic violence and substance abuse. Um, is domestic violence driving substance abuse? Quite probably. Is, is, is substance abuse driving domestic violence? Quite probably. Which is the bigger influence for a particular subpopulation or a particular data set? Um, social media and suicide uh, ideation. Um, is is, suicide, is uh, you know, messaging on social media reflective of existing suicidal ideation, almost certainly. Um, is is uh, suicidal ideation being strongly influenced by social media? Quite, pro quite possibly and probably in some cases. For a particular context, is it? How big and how strong are these effects? Um, when we're dealing with these systems that are coupled, uh, whether they be ecologic, you know, ecologic systems, um, Health, health related systems, etc. Often it's hard to know what's the cause and what's the effect and how big an effect they are, you know, that one is being driven by the other. Um, 
to what degree is this a symptom or what degree is this a cause. Um, and a tool like CCM, when we have theory, so we build models, ladies and gentlemen. We build models um, uh, often for two purposes I'll put in contraposition. It's often not, not clear cut which is which uh, in a, in a, in a full, fully clear way. But models, dynamic models for theory explication. Here we have some theory fairly well defined. Maybe it's a theory, you know, uh, built up by social scientists or health scientists, by those who specialize in addictions, medicine, or what have you. Um, and our models, our simulation models here are trying to capture that theory in a way that allows us to, to, to understand its implications, to understand how the data, what the data is telling us about what's going on, to understand the implications of that theory for which intervention might be best. And if we think about our, our hackathons over the past year, um, many of them have been in this area. We have people come in and give us, you know, the lowdown on on different issues, whether it's hypertension or whether it's issues having to do with colorectal cancer screening, whether it's issues having to do with remand. And we're building models to sort of capture that rooted understanding, put it all into a roof, put it into one place so we can ask what if questions, etc. That's very common in our group, right? But there's another use of models. Models for theory building where we are seeking to, to use models as sort of thinking tools to probe for what might be going on and how could that relate to some of the things that we see um, to, to get the thinking going in a, in, a, in a more clarified way as to what you know, what might be the most useful way to kind of characterize situations in the world. Some of our work with Kurt Stange's group involving primary care was kind of along these lines. It wasn't that Kurt was looking for a model that, you know, would tell us uh, by how many minutes we should increase the primary care appointments length in order to achieve, you know, a 25% increase in, in, uh, in the um, effectiveness of diagnosing major chronic diseases. No, he was looking for models that would sort of serve as, as thinking tools that would let us better understand these issues, help, help us better walk through in our heads what might be going on. These are models for theory building. And often in this sphere, we don't have the luxury of really knowing causally with clarity what's driving what. In this area, explication, often people have suspicions that they've done randomized controlled trials which control for all sorts of things and examine how much is, if you just change this, how much does it change other things. They have big problems in many areas, but they can better help us understand aspects of causality. And rightly or wrongly, they're sort of viewed as gold standard for establishing causal linkages. But they're extremely expensive to run. They're, they're often very time consuming, often for ethical reasons. They can't be run as you'd like it to. And there's many other factors that get in the way of really assessing what real world effects would be. But models in theory building, we're often building up our understanding from the ground. We're not sure how much is this driving that or that driving this. And using CCM in this context, can be very useful to, to try to assess hmm, to what degree is it likely that you know in this subgroup we're seeing this influence of social media on actual cases of suicidal ideation or suicide attempts um, or, or even you know committed uh, suicides, uh, suicides which, which were completed. Um, here you know we might use CCM to explore plausibly what things might be causally driving others in a way that would then allow us to sort of start to probe with a model and with uh, drawing on the literature and, and other scientific primary data collection to try to understand why we're seeing these connections. So that's one way 
in which CCM plays a role. There's another key role. Look, in our models, I've got to write these things down. Um, I think somewhere I have have a list of musings on this, and I've got to, I got to give it to you. Um, don't worry, I'm not planning a duel. Um, uh, but I've got to get it out of uh, out there. So another use is, look, we build models to help us understand the world. We build dynamic models to help us understand processes. Those models incorporate representation of causal linkages, right? The models have causal linkages between variables. They, they embody, they characterize causal linkages, these models that we built. We can get synth synthetic data, data produced by those models out of those models. We can tell it, go record these variables over time and output it. And it gives us long time series. And we may have analyzed those time series from the world, for many of them, or at least for, for a good subset. We might have data from the world that corresponds to that time series-wise. If we run CCM on data from our models, Guess what? We will see the sorts of causal connections that we see in the models, but we'll also get some sense of their relative strength from the model. Because I haven't talked about it, but the value of rho to which this asymptotes is, is strongly affected by the causal strength of a causal linkage. And we can compare those results from CCM from our models on the one hand with similar results from comparable data sets on the other from the world and ask to what degree is this model good, not merely in terms of matching output data similar to the patterns that we see in the world, not merely cross-validation in terms of maybe reproducing a data set that we didn't use to build it, as powerful as that is, but to what degree does it match the causal signatures we see from the world? These causal signatures that are present in this data that whisper to us about what's driving what. To what degree do those mirror what we see in our dynamic model? That is an extremely powerful grounding capability to challenge our models. Our models may posit levels of causal driving of variable x by y, which are altogether out of sync with what we see from the world. And we can use CCM to challenge our models more effectively at a causal level. We can also use it to alert us when we've, we've missed a boat because our model, I mean, this is by extension of those comments, our model fails to capture a causal signature of this, you know, of Z on, on X, but it's very obvious in the data from the world that Z is influencing X. And this has enormous value because another thing we could do with the model is to incorporate noise. And we can actually incorporate in the model synthetic noise that is similar to the noise we see from the world in, in terms of its, its sort of level. And we can assess the comparability of the CCM predictions for model-based synthetic data with noise versus comparable data from the world with noise and use that to reason uh, about, about in an apples to apples type fashion. In other words, in a fashion that reflects the fact that with noise, rho doesn't go to one here. That with noise, often there's a limiting of this, you know. Well, it depends how big the noise is. Maybe 0.5, maybe 0.8, sometimes higher than that. Um, but there may be limits. And we can look at comparable things from our model take into account noise and, and you know perform CCM in a way that, that reflects that. So CCM can provide this, this uh, additional crucible um, to test our model against empirical evidence. But it's evidence not not drawn from one only one data set, but from reasoning about the causal linkages. And you know, in a way, in a certain abstract way, this relates to this notion of leveraging our ability to reconstruct state space from empirical data and analogizing it to the state space we see coming out of our models, right? Because our models have 
state space that can be reconstructed from shadow manifolds. Now they also have state space that we can look at directly because we can, if we want to do so, we can, we can, we actually know what the state variables are. But it may be inconvenient to do so. Think about a model with thousands of agents with a state space whose dimensionality um, you know, far exceeds our ability to, to visualize or reason about it. But we can do state space reconstruction via shadow manifolds and assess to what degree is the model patterns jibing with these patterns in the world. It's hard to overstate the potential here. Um, Wade in Toronto last week presented uh, a poster characterizing findings and or elements from um, uh, and, and initial findings from their pertussis model. Wade's, uh, uh, Wade's uh, you know, progress on this on, as part of this team with, with several others, Dr. Doroshenko and, and uh, Karsten Hempel, um, make use of some metrics from data about the world, uh, things like autocorrelation function and things like power spectrum, to sort of judge the model against these metrics from data from the world to judge to what degree does it match the data. Um, but I would argue, and, and it, when we have data sources like time series or, or larger data sources, often we can create different summary measures of it that we expect our model to match. But one of the deepest summary measures, one of the ones that can be most insightful and powerful, I think, is reconstructed state space and indeed these causal signatures. Another thing we could do with a model that's, that's just gorgeous in CCM is to, making a point, um, <laughs> is to use, uh, so you could think of that as Professor Duch in the chat. Um, <laughs> uh, Another, another thing we can do with the model to make, uh, to, um, that, that's of great value is we can ask, to, in order to get a reliable measurement of whether there's a causal signature with CCM, how frequently do we need to measure data or for what time sequence to get this reliably measured given a certain level of noise? So remember, a model can produce very large amounts of data uh, with very little effort, right? If I take a simulation model, I can say, open the spigot, and you know, it will say, yes, ma'am, and it will produce tons of data, right? It, it can flood me with data points. Um, it'll ask, you know, if I say jump, it'll say, how high, right? Um, so, um, so I could get it to sample from that data, uh, very frequently, I could get it to sample less frequently. I could get it to record a longer sequence over time, over a long time horizon, or a short sequence. And I could do so with different levels of noise, um, and perhaps noise kind of similar to what I see from the world in terms of the, the data sets. And I could ask, because I know the true situation in the simulation model, I know what's causally driving what, I could ask, how finely sampled the data set, how long a time horizon uh, uh, do I need to, to get clear causal signal. I can assess to what degree are my analyses on empirical data likely to be m masked by, not that mask, but the M-A-S-K, masked by noise, by the presence of noise. In short, I can use models to position myself more judiciously to use the tools of data science. To collect data more with, with greater clarity of, to use the, Jeff has given me so many, um, so many wonderful phrases. Um, and one of them is, um, uh, you know, how to, how to measure things that matter. Um, how to measure the right things, measure them with the right frequency, not overdoing it, not, not neglecting it. How much data we need to, to have a reliable analysis of these, these data sets using uh, data science tools. Models, dynamic models are almost an ideal tool, sort of, uh, uh, you know, toolbox 
for examining these questions because they are they can allow us to produce data in quantity where the ground truth is precisely known, the synthetic ground truth, the ground truth of the model, and ask under what conditions are our inferences with CCM or our inferences with any number of data science techniques accurate, and to what degree will they mislead us, or more constructively, to what under what conditions do they have blind spots? And, and what are these blind spots, and how can we limit our exposure to these blind spots? Are there different ways of measuring it, or things that we could measure um, that would lessen our vulnerability to these uh, misperceptions of the situation? And the key defining thing about that is, I'll, I'll list two. One, we can use the model to generate arbitrary amounts of, of, of data, and number two, we know the precise situation of the model, so we have the ground truth. And those two things combine to provide us great insight into what, what we can do reliably and where we have to be careful with data science techniques. And for this answer, I am indebted to Xiaoyan's question. So thank you so much for asking that question. And with those comments, ladies and gentlemen, I will rest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I always have this temptation to clap when you finish the class. <laughs>